From the College by the Lake, meeting the personalities and discussing the issues that affect all of Coeur d'Alene and the Inland Northwest, we are the North Idaho College Public Forum. And now, here's your moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome to our program. Today we're going to deal with art, and our particular style is going to be pen and ink work. We're very pleased to welcome to the program Keevan W. Bowers, who is an artist and a consultant. Uh, Keevan, welcome to the program. We're happy to have you here. I would like to give a little background to our guest. Uh, he is described in his literature as his work is created with what he calls the pointillistic style, and he works at the pace of about 6,000 uh, dots for every 5 to 10 minutes. What makes his work so unique is not the technique, but the style. Keevan uses positive and negative space to create an image that carries all the feeling and emotion that goes along with size. Keevan is a pro former professional boxer and an AAU freestyle wrestler. He gave up this profession in 1982 and continued with his artwork. In the spring of 1987, he was invited to attend various art show activities in Charleston, South Carolina. Returning to northern Idaho, Keevan started Van de Bong Artists with the idea of displaying fine art on the sidewalks of the tourist-oriented resort area in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, welcome to our program. We're very happy to have you here. We know that you brought some of your works, and we're looking forward to seeing those and to talking to you about your different uh, uh, types of paintings, and uh, we're just delighted that you're here. It's nice being here. Also welcome to the program regular panelist Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development with Idaho College. And Steve, thank you for joining with us today and questioning our guests in this interesting and fascinating artwork. You're welcome, Tony. Uh, Keevan, we have decided uh, that we would do this show with a particular format. We're going to show some of your works first and walk through those. And again, these are only samples of your work. We've done much, much more than this. And upon uh, the finishing of that presentation, then I shall invite uh, Steve to commence the questioning about uh, your history in the art world. Uh, I believe this time that we will show uh, the first uh, painting that uh, you have brought with you today. And uh, I do believe you have named most all your paintings. And you can tell us what most that is. And I believe you've also even selected some music that we will use in mm -hmm. helping us understand and appreciate your work. Good. I know now that we have your first painting uh, on the monitor. Yeah, this one's called The Waiting. She was done in 1987 of a very close friend. And I had traded, I had given her a, a very nice piece of work and she stood for me for about six hours. Her legs got sore, her arms got sore. So it, we had to break up the sitting for quite a while. And it took me two and, about two and a half years to finish this one. It's got about four or five million dots on it. Uh, when I finished her, I got stood it up one time and looked at it and decided that it was not, you know, you couldn't complete something with just one single image on there, so I had to add to it. And that also uh, broke me into an idea that, you know, my work was maturing as I was going on because I was adding more to the pictures instead of eliminating. And by adding the frame, which took a while to decide on, and also there were some other things that was unique with this picture that I had tried for the first time that has also added to a three-dimensional quality to my work, too. And uh, Yeah, in, in, in relation to that, too, that we probably won't see all that on, on this particular yeah. shot because we have others to show that we need to get up on the, on the monitor. But uh, when you're doing something of this size, it's, it's, you know, it's really almost life-size. Uh, how long did it take to do that? Well, this one took me, the person herself took me about two years, but I was going in and, you know, working with it off and on. You know, most artists, when they uh, get burned out with the per picture, they will move on to another one, come back to it. So the picture becomes uh, refreshed in his mind again, and continue, I'll continue to go back. So some artists, don't they, they will, they will do only one work till they finish, but others will work mm -hmm. on more than one thing at a time. So I hear you awesome. saying that you move back and forth. But yeah, I work. usually have anywhere between two and four pictures going at any one time. And uh, usually an extremely large one, which I'm working on right now, and then usually some small ones, which I can finish, you know, real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to ask them to give us a, your second painting that you brought with us today okay. and let you describe what that particular one is. I had uh, been studying a lot on George O'Keefe's work, and I never really paid attention to her work until I was working with a gallery in here in Coeur d'Alene. 
and a very fine artist, Shirley Arntz, got shown me that you can expand rather than on your work, rather than just you know keeping to one subject matter. And so I got the idea of using buffalo skulls and you know cow skulls, and I found it intriguing what O'Keefe did with them, rather than showing it as a sign of death, more of a sign of life. And so I did a major search and was able to find quite a bit of them. I found some through down in southern Idaho. Keeping what do you call this particular piece? This, this is a living in the um, big sky country. You and I had a, a discussion uh, prior to the show, which is always very, very helpful. And you indicated that a lot of artists in this particular part of the United States do a lot of Western work, and mm -hmm. here is an example of your Western work. Uh, and a lot of people are looking for that particular style, but you also do a lot of things that's certainly not Western, and, and that appeals to a different kind of audience, doesn't it? Yeah, over here I find that um, probably 75% of the market are, is you know, definitely Western, and it's the people that are moving in from out of state, now the area that are interested and more the modern contemporary rather than the, uh, the western aspect. I've had people literally say, is, there, is this all there is in this part of the country? And then I show my work and they know there's not. But there are quite a few other artists in here in this part of the country doing some different things rather than, you know, abs you know rather than uh, deer, duck, and elk. You know, your third work now has come up on the screen and if you would describe again this piece for us and also uh, okay. what it is called. And a little history behind it, because I know there's, there's got to be history behind yeah. each work. That this you one work. has, it's untitled. It was, uh, I had just started working with acrylics, and it, after working with pen and ink for so long, I wanted to try my hand at something different. Um, the acrylics are easier to work with, faster. You know, if I did the same picture in dots, it'd probably take me two months in the same technique rather than using uh, acrylics. Do you have a preference of one over the other, or just di a difference? Uh, pen and ink for fineness, uh, acrylics for speed, and also I can get a lot of rough ideas down, but I've had a lot of interest in my acrylics, so I've been displaying them more. Uh -huh. Does your own schedule have anything to do with the, uh, a particular time, or if there's a lot of demand you know, for your work that you have to go with something that you can produce faster? Or? Uh, not really. I don't produce... No, I don't work for any gallery or any publishing company or anything like that. I, you know, I market my own work and mm -hmm. been doing so for, uh, well, about seven years. Mm -hmm. All right, your next piece now has just come okay. up on the screen. and <clears throat> If you would describe this one, uh, uh, do you have this one named? Nope, this one's not titled. It took me a year and a half to finish it because I had finished part of it because my girlfriend got the wrong color paint. <laughs> so I had, to, I, had to send, I had to go out and find the same paint. It took me quite a while. When I finished, I liked the image, you know, the, la the lack of everything there, to give a little bit more to the imagination rather than the, um, you know, just everything obvious. Kevin, one thing that really has impressed me, uh, Kevin, excuse me, about your work, and we talked about this too earlier, that you do leave a lot to the imagination mm -hmm. in some of your paintings. So, like, you'll do individuals and, and, and you're very powerful with the face, mm -hmm. but you don't complete the dress and so forth, the clothing. And that again, are you, are you suggesting to the person admiring the work to uh, use their own imagination? or what, what, What's the reason behind doing that? Well, when a person looks at a picture, it's, it's okay to have everything there, but you might as well go out and take a photograph, you know, rather than just painting, you know, letting the people's imagination work for them. Uh, some people don't like doing that. Uh, you find a lot of uh, expression toward prints of finished, completed works of basically deer, duck, and elk. Uh, and then you've also find uh, if I can interrupt, we're going to uh, take a look at your next uh, work that is up uh, on the screen and tell us what this is. This one is called Heritage, um, part French, Canadian, Indian, and English. And I was, after being interested in George O'Keefe's work, I went down to Richfield, Idaho and found out in a field a uh, uh, cow skull, so to say, in which there's a lot of them down there from what I understand. And this lady had this particular one in her flower bed and I asked her if it would be okay if I sketched it out and did it, and she said it was okay. And I was really fascinated by the three-dimensionalism I was able to capture with it. And other, even oil painters that I've showed it to her were a little bit impressed with it, so I was quite happy with it. Yes. Now, in doing all of this uh, different kind of work, uh, with, as they're giving us our next uh, painting that you've done, uh, you work on this on a very structured basically don't you? you work a yes. lot of hours each day I mean you, you're very disciplined yes. is what I'm attempting mm -hmm. to say yes I am 
How many that, um, hours a day on a normal day do you put in? Oh, I would say between eight and twelve hours a night, going until four or five in the morning. It just it also depends on you know outside jobs and stuff like that. It depends on the load I can put on it, but I put something into it every day, either marketing or also. Okay. Uh, now we now have your next painting. Yeah, this one was the uh, first one I ever done in dots. This was the one that uh, actually got me into doing pointillism. My ex-wife was very knowledgeable. She studied back in New Jersey and down in L.A. And she, after seeing this one, I was just trying to soften a picture. I wasn't trying to work for anything. And she looked at it and she goes, you know, this is unique. It's different. Don't ever change from this. If you're ever going to be known as an artist, it will be for this technique. We didn't even know what the name of it was. It took me another four years to actually gain that. So it became kind of your signature, mm -hmm. didn't it? Yes, it has. Yes, that's really nice. Uh, also, in relation to uh, the work that you're doing, you go back and forth, it seems to me, between uh, not only the different styles that you've identified, but at times you <laughs> emphasize individuals, and other times you uh, emphasize other things in, in our environment other than people. Yeah, I, you know, there's a lot of artists that um, they capture, you know, certain things. That's basically their signature. Mm -hmm. I haven't gotten to that point yet. I think that comes with the maturity of work. I, when you, I find this particular kind of, painting really fascinating that, that you've done. If you would describe it for us, of course, it has no name. It was it was done the same time the other untitled, other large untitled one was done. And I had a model all set up for this one. And when she couldn't, she wasn't available. I used the photograph for it. It's you know, it's certainly what they call, I, I guess it falls in the realm of creative flash because when you see something in your mind that looks so good, it just happens all of a sudden, you, you want to put it down rather than, you know, waiting. And usually with models, you have to schedule a time and a place that you can do this, and it doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're dealing with models, of course, this, like you're saying, scheduling, it, mm -hmm. there will be a longer period than if you're working from a photograph. But do you find it more effective to use a model than if you're working from a photograph? I like working live. More, more inspiring mm -hmm. to, to get the features. Huh? Definitely. We're going to show now another painting. And I, when I viewed this one the other day, I found it really different, and I, I just, I was really intrigued by it. Yeah, I was, um, I was studying an artist's work from back east, and I got looking at his work, and he used a lot of contrasting colors, very strong, powerful. And I wanted to see what effect it would have on my work. And I had never worked this large. This is the first time I've actually worked with an image, this large, a singular image. And so it was kind of new to me, and I wanted to give it a shot. And I've had nothing but, you know, very receptive uh, uh, responses toward this picture. And again, again, our monitor doesn't show yeah. sometimes the entire uh, painting, and so that was a very, very large one. Was, I assume that took yeah. a, a considerable amount of time. Not really. Working with acrylic, uh, it's already finished in my head, and I can, I can produce extremely fast. So in those kind of things, it's, it's all there even before you put mm -hmm. it down on It is. Canvas. Finished work is always there. You can, I think most artists can look at something and already know what it's going to look like when it's finished. Kept, uh, Keevan, we're going to show one final work that, that you did today. I mean, you've done others, of course, but this is all that we have time for on the program. If you would describe this final uh, piece that you've brought with you. I would say this is the... I didn't name this one. I, did, I haven't had time. I haven't had time to study it. But it is the original Hutter Blinney picture, and it is the signature of most of my years as an artist. I have fell into uh, doing this uh, for the Holiday Inn. Not, I mean, a Red Lion Motor Inn over in Spokane. They were looking for some work for their offices that had no windows, and I found this was a very viable uh, method, very expressive. And plus, when you put it into a room where there is no windows, it opens it up quite a bit. Uh, it's something new. I've had um, people from uh, Long Beach, California, take a look at it, and ex especially gallery owners and people who actually set up shows like the way the balloons sit there and they look more rounded rather than just a flat two-dimensional image. And that's something I was trying to work for, to, for quite a while. Al, I want to thank you uh, for bringing these works in today. And it takes well, some time you. to get them all to our studio and the time you spent putting it up. But it, you're a very, very talented uh, artist. And I know that Steve wants to join with us now in uh, okay. questioning you about uh, some, some of the work and others that we haven't seen. Even a couple of times uh, we have referred to a form of art uh, known as pointillism. Maybe yeah. you take a minute and explain to us what that is. Okay. Pointillism was um, worked back in ancient China, but it was, I don't know how it was dropped, but anyway, it, it hasn't been used 
uh, for quite a while, and then it was picked back up in the 1800s by a name by a man by the name of George Sura, and he was a um, an artist who worked with paint, but he saw things a little different. Instead of working like most impressionists, where they blended their colors, what he did was put them real close together. Use a lot of geometry and mathematics to blend his work. Where he, instead of uh, uh, blending them with the colors and stuff, he let the eyes or the optical mixtures, as he called it, blend them for him, rather than uh, just automatically doing it. So instead of seeing a picture up close, you had to step way far back, and then your eyes would blend the colors and mix them, and you'd get the image of what you were looking at. Now, how does the work we've just been seeing, uh, how, how does that compare to the pointillism you were, you well, were just describing? Pointillism, uh, as, as I've described, is more of a technique rather than a style. Uh, Seurat was a, a neo-impressionist. He was the father of impression or uh, um, post-impressionism, and it was he capable of producing the same kind of detail that we've no. seen in your work. No, he. Uh, if you ever see his work, it'll be more uh, hazed, and because of the effect, you have to step back. And I, I don't know, I think today he would, he would be doing it the way I'm, well, I'm, not do, I'm doing it, I suppose, because it is a lot faster, he can gain his technique a lot better. And Impressionism, per se, has, is still alive, but it's not, I don't think it's used as much. I haven't seen as much out there as I used to be. Well, let's talk a little bit about your background now, if we can. Uh, tell us about yourself, where you're from, and uh, whether or not you've, you've uh, studied formally. Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm particularly interested in knowing how you moved from boxing to, uh, to <laughs> art. <laughs> Well, I've always, I'm from, originally from Haver, Montana. I was raised in Post Falls, I, where I you know, studied all the normal things kids study, including drawing all over desks where the teachers would meet me at the front door with a bottle of Windex and paper towels. And uh, all through high school, junior high, I always sketched a lot. And I was also very active in sports. And when I got out of high school, I joined the service, got married, that type thing. And there, my, I got my ex-wife uh, was very intuitive as toward athletic ability and stuff like that. She used to help train me when I was in boxing. She was also very intuitive as toward um, the artist in me, and I, you know, people see things further sometimes than what you would do, and she saw I think a lot more in me than I did at that time because I had completely put it away. I hadn't picked up a pencil or anything. And my main response to her was, you know, you know how much this is going to cost? It's not exactly the most inexpensive hobby. And she goes, well, you're driving me crazy. Do this, please, you know, save me some time. So I did. I picked it up. And as I, the whole time I was going along, she would make a comment here, a comment there, you know, well, I kind of like this if you did it this way, or I kind of like that if you did it that way. And so by listening to those, I would say they're gentle comments. They weren't, you know, do this or do that. I was able to adjust my way of thinking down to what I'm doing. And how I got into pointillism is I was working on a picture and I just wanted to soften it. I wasn't trying for anything. I wasn't trying for any image or That's any the detail. That's you showed mm -hmm. us earlier. The very first one from the back. And so when I loosened it up with dots, given that softening effect, I showed it to her and she, she just goes, if you were ever going to be known as an artist, it will be for this. This is different, it's unique. Some of these areas, what you've done, are just really good. And so from there, that kind of encouragement, but there wasn't that much encouragement, but it was very poignant when she did. And so my pictures got more detailed, more elaborate, well, larger, rather than more elaborate. I didn't feel that, um, you know, making a picture more elaborate was actually better. Sometimes less is more, or less is better. Something else we've talked about, there's, there's a lot of judgmental, uh, factors that come into all uh, areas of life and people are critics sometimes uh, uh, without being asked to be so uh, in one's life. But we talked about art with you, Kievan, and uh, uh, for some reason pen and ink or, and also the work you've done in the pointillistic style has not been accepted to the same extent that others. Is, is what made this happen or, and is this going to change? Uh, you're going to have the same kind of status that that other artists have? Well, I don't know if I'll uh, obtain that status. I would like to. I think every artist would. Uh, it's a matter of how tenacious you are as toward your ability, your craft, uh, how much you believe in yourself, your work, 
and how much you're willing to put yourself on the line every time you walk out there and show a person a picture that you obviously know will not understand it and will not like it. So it's just a matter of how, you know, you know, gut instinct of knowing this is good, I believe in it. Now, eventually it's like the, the odds, you know, pretty soon the odds are going to turn around where people start liking it rather than disliking it. And I'm going off of that a lot. But I've been very lucky in the sense as a young artist in this area. Is the art world becoming more tolerant, however, and uh, accepting more different approaches to um, the field? Not so much in North Idaho. I see a lot of expressive artists, but I don't see a lot of acceptance as toward um, different, me well, different subject matters. Or How about in the United uh, States overall? I think it's really... Remain- you've been yeah. Charles and South Carolina, the places where yeah. you've worked. I think uh, uh, New Indifference more accepted over there than it is over here. I s- uh, when I was over there, I saw 25 artists in a three-block period three-block area that were all making money, and they were all selling their work. But of course, they were all doing architectural renderings and, and the churches and the streets and stuff. It was very touristy. And I went in there with my hot air ballooning pictures, and I was kept so busy over the next two months while I was there that I was selling pictures before they were even done. And that's, you know, I had one artist comment, you know, that I must be really rich in order to uh, be able to sell my originals. Well, I don't think it was rich as more it was just, you know, that term starving artist was to make a, you know, make a buck off of what I could do with my work. And I was real lucky in the sense that I walked even over there with my work and was able to market it to, uh, you know, a majority of people rather than a very select group of people. You referred to the fact that uh, both on this program and in a previous talk that we had, that when you're an artist and you finish a, a piece and you present it to the public, <clears throat> that is somewhat risky. It takes some courage because You've placed it out there and said, judge this. Uh, how do you as an artist deal with that? Well, myself, I know a lot of, I, I know quite a few artists that will do take it personal. And, and, you know, that's okay. But I also know a lot of artists have, have learned something about marketing their own work, is it's a product. After you finish it and you get it away from yourself, it's easier to look on it as a product rather than personal image because you will be offended. If, you, if you're interested in acceptance, you're in the wrong field. Because, I mean, a lot of times if you're doing something completely negative to what's out there, you're winding up, doing, you're winding up standing on the outside looking in rather than the inside looking out. Because individuals, when they're looking at mm-hmm. artwork, are more critical than they are some other oh, definitely. Like, works. Definitely. Like. They look at a piece of work and they say, well, why isn't this here? Why isn't that there? And you're going, well, okay, why don't you like this? And what I do is I turn that around to work for me rather than work against me because you can take a person and they have real reasons, very poignant reasons why they don't like a piece of work. If they don't like a piece of work, why don't you like it? Okay, well, this, the reason why I don't do this is because of this. You know, and you, if you can explain to them if they can, are willing to accept it, there's a lot of clo- closed-minded people out there, but there's also a lot of people, especially moving into this area up here, that are very open-minded, and I think that's going to swing things around where um, different mediums, different styles, techniques will be more accepted rather than be pushed off to the side. Steve Sheen. Kevin, uh, either you or Tony said earlier that you uh, market your own work. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have your own company called Vagabond Artist. No, that, that, was, that was something I started. I, I had an idea coming back from Charleston of pulling artists together and displaying fine art on the sidewalks of Coeur d'Alene. Of course, it, I'm not, I, it was not really well accepted, I should say. Uh, the idea is still there. It's a very good idea. Um, with the way the economy is and the people are, it's something I think could be accepted, but they have to open their minds a little bit because you'd notice places like down in California, mm-hmm. Charleston, South Carolina, over in Paris, they got artists on their sidewalks, and it's a very big draw. It's, mm-hmm. not, it's def- definitely not a detriment to their economy. All right, Vagabond Artists is mm-hmm. no more, but you are still marketing your own work, yes, is that yeah. correct? How are you yes. doing it? And how are you doing at it? Well, uh, like I've said earlier, um, I think I've been very lucky as a young artist in there, this area. I'm very tenacious and I don't stop you know, showing it to people. And when Tony first saw my work, I threw him a big thick portfolio and said, you know, take a look and see what you like. And that's basically how I sell my work is, you know, anybody who will look, pretty soon they're going to see something to like or they have an idea about what they like. And, you know, when you're willing to work with a person's idea, you're able to, you know, get them more acceptable toward your form of work. And then people already, you know, they, if they already see something they like, you know, it's, that makes it easier because then you don't have to 
you know, you don't have to produce something specifically for that person. Is this the, and this is a tough question, obviously, but is this the right place for you to be? Uh, you mentioned other places you've been where selling on the sidewalk was a, was a lucrative business for you. Um, are you. Are you swimming upstream here in North Idaho, or? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, uh, in some ways yes, in other ways no. I see. I see in the future things turning around where things are going to be more accepted, and anybody who starts in this area will be synonymous with it, and they'll grow with it and become mature with it, and you will think of an artist or you will think of an area and you will think of, well, I, got, I bought this work here. It's kind of like what George O'Keefe was to tell us, not saying that I would ever become anything like her, but in the sense that you know, new and different will stand out eventually. It's just a matter of time and effort and amount of effort you want to put into it and the drive you have to go behind it. Your, um, your ex-wife told you that this was it for you, this was the style, and if you were going to make it as an artist, you'd make it this way. Mm -hmm. Are you through experimenting? Is, is this? Oh, no. I'm never, yeah, I don't think you should ever be through experimenting on anything. If you're an artist, I mean, what's, what's the one gift you have? You have the uh, creative force in you. You have to express it. And when you express it, you know, it's going to come out in different forms. Something today may be completely changed tomorrow. You may look at a lot of different things. And uh, even with my work, it's changed over the past seven years. And it'll, hopefully it will continue to change until, you know, the day I'm no longer here. Keevan, I talked to you about this before uh, we had this program. And I've talked to a number of other artists, and some artists tell me that when they do painting and, and they bring them forth, they feel so good because it was what they were. And that's all, that, since they're personally satisfied, that's all that matters. But to others, they feel this real need, the message they have in their painting, that, that the public really understands it and interprets it properly. Do you belong to either one of those particular schools of thought and, and well, what you want to happen to your work? Well, I don't know if I belong to any particular school. All I know is that because of what we were given as artists, I think we have a right and responsibility to give it back. Uh, the judgment, a judgment against artists per se as uh, not being responsible individuals or, you know, sort of say eating bread and cheese, you know, kind of living the high life a little bit. It's a lot of work. I mean, when you get right down to it, you know, I mean, there's no... Uh, I don't know. There's. It's just. It's not a. Uh, it's not something that you can. It, it comes. It, you come. It, you have your center, and you, you yeah. understand what you're doing, whether those do or not. Another thing that must be also important to understand is that a lot of artists appreciate even after their life. So that's another thing that one uh, is seen from history. Yeah. I wish we could continue this, but we have to wrap up the program again. Keevan Bowers, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you. Uh, we for congratulate being you on your work, here. and Steve, thank you for your outstanding questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please be with us again next week at the same time, and we will discuss an important subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. North Idaho College Public Forum is videotaped live by Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to catch the North Idaho College Public Forum the same time next week on this television station.